Welcome to the Live Big Podcast, where real estate expert Nick Paynes shows you that everyone can build wealth through real estate investing. Nick and his featured guests will give you the tools, resources, and expert information you need to leverage real estate into a wealth building strategy. So you can stop worrying about your nine to five and start to live big. Here's Nick with today's episode. Welcome everybody back to the Live Big Podcast. We are on episode eight, um, back with uh, two thirds of the Black Yeti crew. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, we are going to talk today um, about. I should probably ask you how you're doing. You, things good? <sighs> things great. Yeah, no one's sick right now, so that's good. That's always a plus. That's good. <laughs> um, no, no new happenings in the real estate world. Uh, we got a uh, property under contract should be closing soon. Okay. So looking forward to that. We got permits and in, in waiting. Nice. It's just a lot of waiting right now. All right. Good. Well, cool. Um, well, today's episode, we're going to talk about uh, the four goals of real estate investors. So um, generally speaking, and I don't know, maybe other real estate investors have like a fifth or a sixth goal. Uh, but we're talking kind of monetarily, uh, financially, uh, the benefits that we see from from real estate investments. So um, those four are cash flow, appreciation, um, or like equity gain. Those are kind of one and one and the same. Capital preservation or tax incentive. So we're going to talk about those th- those four things. Today. So that's really why somebody would invest in in real estate, right? Mostly because I've never heard somebody go, "I really want to be a landlord." <laughs> like, hey, why do you want to invest in real estate? Oh man, I just man, I think it'd be awesome to be a dreaming about that since <laughs> I was a little kid. <laughs> just want to be a landlord ever since I can remember. <laughs> so, um, anyway, this is the four reasons that, that people invest in real estate, and it's really important to um, to really know why you're investing. Okay, um, it's one of the first things we ask our clients. So, clients comes in, they say, "Hey, I want to start buying some rental property. Why? What's your goal?" Okay, what are you trying to do with your investment? Because each of these categories could involve a different type of investing, could be a change in location. Um, and, you know, like I said, one of the goals isn't going to be wanting to be a landlord. So um, if you're in for cash flow, for example, I always tell people Colorado is not a great cash flow state. Right. Um, you, I, I constantly see properties like on, there's some Facebook groups for, um, investment properties where, you know, you'll see a property that's renting for, you know, let's say it's a quadplex in Cleveland, you know, renting for 800 bucks per unit. So it's, you know, 3,200 a month and the things selling for like 120,000. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. Here in Colorado, if something was making 3,200 a month, it would be a, $500,000, $550,000 property, like easily, right? So the difference is, is that $120,000 condo in, or or quadplex in Cleveland is going to be worth $120,000 in 10 years, right? Where our $550,000 unit is going to be worth a million bucks, you know, million two, something like that. So different areas have different, you know, types of return. You're going to get better cash flow in some areas and better, you know, appreciation in others. So, um, you know, Matt, I think it was you. I think we spoke about this in the in our first episode, uh, if I remember correctly. But no one really buys real estate because they want to be a landlord. Because we buy it because we understand the incentives, right? So I think like after today's episode, people will. I really think there's some things, especially late in this episode, when we talk about some of the tax incentives and capital preservation. Um, you know strategies and techniques that we use. I, I really think that for a lot of people, a light bulb is going to go on. And um, I think you're really going to be blown away with why real estate investing is so powerful and why it's can lead to just tremendous amounts of like generational and legacy wealth. Right. Yep. Um, so I think that what we'll find, I think each of these categories could be an entire you know, episode in itself, but, um, what we're really going to, I really wanted to kind of do is just kind of scratch the surface on some of these and and come back and maybe we'll hit them harder, you know, in, in later episodes. So, um, Matt, first of all, will you start off, we're going to start off talking about cash flow. Uh, so first of all, just explain what cash flow is and sure. So do a simple example on a, you know, single family rental, 
Uh, you have one tenant, that tenant pays rent uh, for a monthly basis. You might you say you make 2000 bucks. I just take out all your expenses. So, you know, mortgage, taxes, insurance, uh, anything else that might come up. If you uh, pay for water, for example, take all those out and what's left over is your cash flow. Okay. So, so my, and maybe even putting some aside for incidentals, like, yeah, whatever, like if you, or if you buy things on a yearly basis, like I always put warranties on my property. So, you know, I've got extra money every month. But once a year, I pay 500 bucks for a warranty on that property. So yeah. you know, putting putting that money aside, basically at the end of the year, kind of what's left over, what's right? Left over, yeah. And you want to take into account too, like if you're evaluating a property, you, know, you can look at, you know, if I get a, a tenant and it makes this much every month, uh, you know, it's going to make so much a year, but you got to calculate in some vacancy too, because when that tenant leaves, it might take a week to get a new person in there. And there's going to be a week period where you're not making money. Right. So there's some vacancy factors, but yeah, looking at it on a, on a yearly basis is best so that you don't miss any of those monthly expenses. Sure. And I think industry standard would be, you know, 5% vacancy, two to three weeks vacancy. So keep in mind, you know, if you got a property that's renting for 3000 a month, so a hundred bucks a day, basically every single day that you don't have that property rented is a hundred dollars, right? Off of your, off of your return. And so if you're vacant for a month, that's 3000 bucks. That could be your entire year's cash flow, yeah. right? So vacancies uh, can be hugely detrimental. That's why we want to make sure we're charging proper rent rate um, so that we get things under, you know, under tenancy and, and, uh, and under a lease agreement as quickly as possible. Right. Um, so, yeah, so cash flow is pretty simple. Right. Um, and, and I think so many people are focused on this, right. Because they, they, that's money in their pocket. Right. But I want to put it into perspective a little bit. I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Um, I know where it stands for me and I'll share it after you go, but out of the four things that we talked about, so cash flow, appreciation, capital preservation, and uh, tax incentive. So let's rank those one through four. Where does cash flow fall for you? As far as what I'm looking for, just in general, yeah. For you personally, where does where does cash flow fall? Like on level of importance, if you were looking at a property um, and knew that these were your four incentives for buying the property, where would cash flow rank for you? Uh, I'd probably put two or three. Um, I think it's important in the sense that you want to have enough that it's always going to cover itself. So yeah. it's always going to pay for itself. Um, but it, it, it's not going to be life changing money. You know, you, we've talked about, you can make a couple hundred bucks a month or whatever. And it takes a lot of those before you do anything. Sure. Um, the appreciation I think is number one for me. That's where you make all your money. Right. Yeah. I think, and, and even for me, and we're going to talk about this a little later on, and, and I'd love to know if I change your mind, right? If I can, if I can, if I can push cash flow actually down to three or four, we'll see. Okay. Maybe we'll, uh, if we, if I remember to revisit it at the end of this episode, but um, for me, cash flow is three, maybe four. Um, and, and the reason being is because I think I'm going to show you guys later in this episode how um, it's actually the least amount of ROI you know, in, in the grand scheme of things. Right. So like right now in Colorado, for example, I think our cash flow numbers on semi, even, even just a semi turnkey property, right. We're not talking about doing like a burr model, like a, a you know, a renovate rent refinance and, you know, repeat type thing, but just buying something, putting a tenant in, in Colorado right now, 200, 300 bucks a month cash flow, maybe. That's a good one. Probably. That would be a good one, right? <laughs> and so uh, when we look at that, that 200, 300 dollars a month, um, and it costs you minimum 100 grand to buy, you know, an out of pocket, not house hacking rental mm-hmm. property, um, our ROI on that we're looking at, you know, two to three percent annualized cash flow. Yeah. Right. So it's it's very little, but I agree with you 100 percent that we want to look for property that is. Um, at least going to pay for itself, mm-hmm. right? So even if we have a break even, right? I'm, I'm okay with that as long as I know I'm going to get the benefits of the other three things that we talked about. So I think it depends on your financial situation too. Like you're able to take on, I wouldn't call it riskier, but something that doesn't cash flow as much because of your financial position. This is someone's very first one. They might want to have a sure. little bit more, especially if they don't know what they're doing. Agreed. I, I think the problem with that though is like, 
as we dig into that, I think the problem is like, think about our, our, our current market. What's the difference between a bad cash flowing property and a good cash flowing property right now? Like a couple hundred bucks, right? Yeah. Like a bad cash flowing property would be something that maybe you lost a hundred bucks a month on. I would be like, yeah, that's not a, we can find something where you at least break even. Yeah. But a good one would be like 200 bucks, right? So the difference between a bad and a good is not that far apart, right? So when you say like, well, if you're a new, you know, if you're a new person that maybe needs a little bit of cash flow, sure. But we're, again, we're talking about 200 bucks a month. And if that's make or break for you, I think you probably shouldn't be investing in real estate in the first place, right? Like, I, again, if you put yourself in a position where you can't pay your mortgage, if your rent doesn't get paid, I think it's a bad position to be in. So if 200 bucks is make or break for you, that's where I think the cash flow thing is, you know, everybody wants cash flow. And I agree. Like if I had the, ch- if I had the choice between 500 and 700, I will take the 700. Okay? <laughs> and if I have the choice between 700 and a thousand with all else being equal, let's, yes, true. let's put that out there. I, I will take the thousand, right? We, we all, everybody wants more cash flow. The reality is in Colorado, especially it's just not where the power of investment, you know, real estate investing lies. Right. And so cash flow is great and you can go out of, out of state and you can get great cash flowing properties. But again, the power of what we're looking to do here, build tremendous amounts of wealth will not come from Cleveland. Okay. No. Well, not a hundred bucks a month. It's just, you're, you're not going to do it. You're, you're going to make, you know, let's say you're cash flowing a thousand bucks a month in Cleveland. That's great. You make $12,000 a year. I'm going to show you how through appreciation and the other things you're going to make tenfold that, you know, in, in Colorado. Right. So, okay. So, that's cash flow. It's pretty simple. That's the easiest one. How much? How much actual money we get to put in our pockets? Um, that, as we already said, is not going to change our life. Is not necessarily going to allow us to quit our job unless we replicate this process over and over and over and over again. Okay. At which point, you still won't really care that much about cash flow. I, I promise. Like you'll you'll see the amount of wealth that gets built on the backside, and you'll be like, "That's what I care about. I don't care about the hundred grand a year. I care about the fact that I'm seeing like a million dollars a year in appreciation." Right. So, because that creates security and legacy and things like that, right? All right. So the second one is appreciation and equity gain. These go together because you get to access these when you sell the property, right? Um, Or when you refinance the property or when you want to borrow against it or or whatever. Okay. So um, for this particular one, I definitely want you to go back. If you haven't listened to episode number one, okay, okay. or even if you had, go back and listen to it again, because this is what Matt and I spent a lot of time talking about is the power of appreciation against a leveraged property, right? So we speak extensively about this concept and why it's why appreciation and equity gain is so powerful, okay? So, but let's just kind of summarize it real quick again, right? So um, just talk about appreciation, equity gains with those, with, with equity gain, and I may be even mislabeling this, but this is principal pay down, okay. right? I know where you're going. And appreciation. So go, go ahead and chat about those for a second. Uh, so principal pay down, is, that's the easy one. It's every month you're making a payment. A portion of that payment is going to the principal. So the balance you owe on your mortgage goes down every month. So even if the value of the property doesn't change, you have more equity in it because your balance you owe the bank is going down. So if you were to sell it, you make more money. Uh, appreciation is when the property becomes more valuable. So when you go to sell it, you know, it's going the other direction You can sell it for more than what you bought it for. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is you're burning the candle from both ends, right? So if you're, if you're here, when you buy the property, property appreciates a little bit and then you have equity, like, because you pay down. So, so all of a sudden that gap that you're creating, you know, starting at your purchase price or when you acquired the property, it's widening on both sides. You're getting the properties appreciating and your loan balance is being paid down, right? So that's where we see these kind of appreciation and equity gains. So, um, all right. So scale of one to four, okay. Most important to least important. Where is this one for you? That one's number one. This one's number one. Yep. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is where the majority of your gains come from. Again, I'm going to say for me, it's number one, but it is possible that it's number two. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to challenge it and I haven't actually run numbers on it. So it'd be interesting. Maybe we put together a quick scenario, but I'm going to challenge us to, to look at when we look at the tax incentives and the capital preservation to see why it actually 
might be number two. So we'll get into that here in a minute. Um, so I want to give a realistic example of what a portfolio might look like in terms of cash flow and appreciation. So I want people to understand why we rank them where they where they rank, right? So let's take, for example, let's take like a medium-sized portfolio. Okay, let's say you own $5 million in, in real estate. Okay, and obviously that's all relative. That might be small for someone, that might be large, that might be medium, okay? So $5 million in real estate, and let's say it's fully leveraged at... 75%. So you owe 3.75 million on it. Okay. And I think realistically speaking, if you owned $5 million in real estate and we can break it down so that I can understand the numbers even better, that would be 10 single family properties at a half a million bucks a piece, for example. Okay. Right now in Colorado, I think it's realistic for something that's leveraged at 75%, a $500,000 property. I think you could cash flow $300 per month. Okay. Okay. So times 10 means your cash flow at this point is $3,000 a month. So you own 10 properties, you get cash flow of $3,000 per month. That's $36,000 per year. We've already had a little bit of a conversation on this, which is can you quit your job for $36,000 a year? Uh, probably not. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it going to change your life significantly? That's debatable. Okay. We talked about on the first episode how with $4,000 a month, you could go to Hawaii, you could buy a Ferrari, all that fun stuff, right? <laughs> so um, $3,000 a month, sure, it's a great little income. Okay. So $36,000 a year, but $5 million worth of real estate. Okay. And a loan balance of $3.7 million. Okay. And I'm going to totally butcher this, this number, and some lender is going to comment or call me and tell me I'm wrong on this, but $3.7 million dollars leveraged okay from a principal from a principal pay down standpoint okay just off the top of my head for every five hundred thousand dollars in loan amount you have you're probably somewhere around six grand of principal pay down per year about seven times that it's like 42 yeah okay so you're looking at 40 forty two thousand dollars of principal pay down per year so first of all just an equity gain just in principal pay down if the property didn't appreciate at all we've already exceeded your cash flow yep. okay so we got thirty six thousand in cash flow we got forty two thousand dollars in principal pay down on three point seven million dollars worth of property now let's get into the appreciation side five million dollars worth of property okay nationally averaged. Okay. We, I think again, one of my episodes, we talked about national average of appreciation, but um, national average of appreciation is four and a half to 5%. Um, and over the last 10 years, it's been like 7% or something like that. But let's take like a super conservative number. Let's take 4%. Okay. 4% appreciation, which again, Colorado hasn't seen forever. So, you know, if we're going to use Colorado cash flow numbers, I think it's only fair to use Colorado appreciation numbers. Yeah. But for the sake of argument, let's just use the worst case scenario or the, or the very conservative number of 4%. Okay. 4% of $5 million is 200 grand. A lot of money. Okay. So $200,000 worth of appreciation, $42,000 worth of equity Pay down. pay down or principal pay down is just a hair under a quarter of a million dollars in wealth growth. It's not money in your pro- in your pocket. Okay. So I know somebody might fight me on this, but would you rather have $250,000 in wealth or $36,000 in cash? I'll take the wealth. I'll take the wealth too. Especially because I know that if I now have $250,000 in new wealth, Okay. I can go borrow 175,000 of it if I want to. And then I can use that 175,000 to go acquire another piece of property or two more pieces of property. Yeah. And then in that case, my cash flow will actually go down because I borrowed some of it. But then when I acquire those two new properties, it'll go back up and I'll be about even again. My cash flow will stay at 3,000. But now with that $175,000, I'll have acquired another. Eight hundred thousand dollars with real estate, yeah. seven hundred thousand dollars with real estate. Now I have five point seven million. My cash flow hasn't changed, but now what is my equity growth? My principal pay down, my appreciation due next year. Bigger. Now it's two hundred and seventy thousand, right? And it's this snowball effect, right? Mm-hmm. So do the math, do the compound effect, whatever you want to do. You know, add two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in in net worth to your net worth for the next 10, 15 years, and compound it. You know, don't even add 250,000, just add 5%, right? And see what happens. 
Okay. And then if you take that $36,000 in cash flow and you save that and you reinvest that too, now you accelerate the growth of being able to, you know, acquire more property. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's incredibly powerful, right? So now we're, so I think that's a very realistic example. Okay. Of a medium sized portfolio. So I'll make it really simple guys. If you, if you're just, if you're like, well, I'm not even thinking about $5 million of the property. I'm thinking about one. Okay. Just take everything I just told you and divide it by 10. Right. So now you got $3,000 in cash flow. Okay. You got $4,000 in principal pay down, $4,200 in principal pay down and $20,000 in equity growth. So you just added $27,000 to your net worth in one year yep. with one property. Pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. It snowballs. And it snowballs. And it makes it easy. Once that, once that first property builds up and you can borrow against that, do it again. Mm-hmm. Okay. You will give up cash flow each time. But it's very simple. That's why Matt and I can sit here and agree that cash flow is definitely lower. We will give up cash flow for the acquisition of more property. Every single day. Yep. We do it all the time. We re-leverage property all the time. Okay. All right. The third one. Okay. And we're actually, I'm going to combine the third and the fourth capital preservation. Okay. And tax incentive. They kind of go hand in hand. Right. And so this is something that we don't see as much on the lower levels. Okay. When you buy your first property, okay, it's not hugely right. Like the, the, you're not going to see ton of, tax incentive and, and, you know, uh, uh, capital preservation at this point, but as you scale, it starts to become more and more significant. Okay. And I think with the next, this next, uh, you know, 10, 20 minutes or so of this podcast, like I'm going to ruffle some feathers with some of the things we're going to talk about. And I'm okay with that because I want people to really understand how this works and that the tax strategies that are used by the extremely wealthy and people that own real estate, they're legal strategies. This is part of the tax code because, well, let's be honest, the tax code is written by the rich. Okay. So they put some really nice incentives in them in there for themselves. Um, but it is something that regular people can do and regular people can take advantage of. Okay. So um, capital preservation, right, is a great problem to have, right? Capital preservation is when people have so much cash in the bank that they need something to do with it that isn't going to cost them a ton of money in in tax or when they make so much money that they have to find somewhere to put it and avoid being taxed over and over and over again, right? Because the the dollar is taxed so many times, right? Every dollar you make is taxed so many times. It's taxed as income tax, and then it's taxed as sales tax, and then it's taxed on your property tax. Like you get the same dollar gets taxed way more than a dollar, right? So people find a way to, to do that. So the first thing to understand is to, to understand why the tax incentives are so important, first of all. For people who are considered to be rich or wealthy. Matt, what is the number one expense for those people? I think actually for everyone, their biggest expense is taxes. And the government's taking 10, 20, 30% of what you make. Well, if you make 50 grand a year, is that going to be your biggest expense though? Because you make 50 grand a year, what tax bracket are you going to be in? 12%, 15% effective? Yeah. Yeah. Because you're well, getting- I mean, what other expense do you have that's... I mean, maybe housing housing is better. Okay. Yeah, right. Like, they, somebody's going to make fifty thousand a year. They're going to pay two grand to live somewhere. Yeah, at least in Colorado. Yeah. Right. They're going to rent somewhere for two grand. They're going to have a mortgage for two grand. So people are making fifty thousand a year, for example. Their biggest expense is going to be their house, probably. Okay. Thirty yeah. percent of their income. In fact, most people qualify at thirty That's- to thirty-five percent of their income is their housing payment. That's a fairly standard, yeah. right? Thirty to thirty-five percent. Okay. Somebody who's making 50 grand a month, what's their biggest expense? There's tax. taxes, like yeah. by far, right? Because not only are they not paying a 12% effective tax rate, they're paying like a 30 to 40% effective tax rate, okay? But they can have an $8,000 a month mortgage payment, which would be a beautiful house. Yeah. And it's not even 10% of their income. Yeah. So like as a percentage, taxes are by far, they're going to pay 20 grand in taxes, right? 40% of their income is going to be tax $20,000 a month versus 8,000 for a big, beautiful multi-million dollar home. Yeah. Right. So the, the issue that we run into or 
let me restate this. The tax strategies that real estate investors use can be so powerful, especially if you can get yourself to a point like Matt and Charlie, okay? Or in my case, because I work in real estate, okay? We are classified as what are called real estate professionals, okay? Because we work in the real estate industry. I work in it as a, as a broker and as, a, um, as, a, as an agent, and I have my, my rental properties. And Matt and Charlie work as real estate professionals because what they do for their career is they work in real estate, yeah. right? Prior to quitting your jobs and working in the insurance industry, you were not a real estate professional. I was not. Because you have to have a certain amount of hours by the tax code. Mm-hmm. And that certain amount of hours has to exceed anything else that yeah. you do. So if you have a full-time job, you have to have more hours in real estate than in that other full-time job. So that's right. really, it has to be your full-time job. That's right. Right? So from a tax code standpoint, how do the rich keep their money? Okay? There's a couple ways that, that, they, that they do it. Okay? Let's use... Um, First of all, let's let's think about how people take advantage of the tax code as it is right now. Okay, I remember many years ago. I don't even remember what year it was, but Mitt Romney was running for president, and people were slaying Mitt Romney over the fact that he paid basically an effective tax rate of fifteen percent at the time. So, and he was like, "I don't. I get paid with capital gains. Like all of my investments, they're long term capital gains. So I don't. Yeah, I don't pay income tax." because I don't get paid for my job. I, I, I get paid in capital gains. And so people were slaying him because he's this rich guy that's only paying 15% in taxes. I look at that and I go, well, first of all, that's not even egregious. Like yeah. 15% uh, you know, compared to what other people are paying, yeah. it's pretty good, right? You get people that are now in the real estate world, real estate professionals, okay? One comes to, comes to mind that there's lots of mixed opinions about, but Donald Trump, okay? Matt, do you know what Donald Trump's effective tax rate was when they pulled his taxes to this last year? I don't. I know he says he doesn't pay taxes because that's for dumb people. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does say that. Um, anyway, Donald Trump's uh, effective tax rate was 4%. So as much as people wanted to like just crush Romney over 15%, Donald Trump pays 4%. Guys like Robert Kiyosaki, zero. I don't think Robert Kiyosaki pays a dime in tax. I think if you go actually listen to Robert Kiyosaki's podcast or any of his youth, like he'll tell you he doesn't pay a dime in tax. He's a billionaire. Is he a billionaire? He's a billionaire. Okay. So like they don't pay taxes. They do not. How? How do they do that? Right. So... I don't want to sit here and like discuss the validity of Trump's tax returns, right? So like maybe he's paying 4% because he's doing shady stuff or not. I don't, that, that's a different conversation, right? Mm-hmm. But the reality is, is he does have the ability to pay 4% or even less like Robert Kiyosaki legally. Okay. And this is where I'm going to argue that it is potentially more valuable the tax incentive is potentially more valuable than even the appreciation side, which we just showed you is tremendously more valuable than cash flow. Mm-hmm. And this is where the light bulb should start to turn on to for people. Cause some people look at the, from a very like 60,000 foot view, they look at real estate investing and they only look at cash flow. They only, and they, they, they go, Oh, that's good cash flow. I, I want to invest in that. Think about it. That's how people invest in, stock market. Some people are like, oh yeah, I get dividends. Or that's why they buy treasury or bonds because they go, oh yeah, 4%. That's great. I get a 4% treasury note. Yeah. I get a 4% bond, a 5% bond. They're only getting cash flow. That's it. <laughs> and they're happy with that. And I'm like, it is by far the worst, the worst incentive in real estate investing. Mm-hmm. Like by far. We already said that appreciation outpaces the cash flow by seven, eight, nine fold in states like Colorado. Yeah. Okay. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the tax code. Okay. So Matt, I want you to explain to me, we're going to go kind of, kind of deeper here, but first of all, start with somebody buys a single family residence. Okay. And rents it out or turns their single family residence that they were living in prior. They now turn that into a rental property. What tax incentives do they now have? 
Uh, so the big one is just depreciation. So all the income that you make on your rental property, you're not getting taxed the same way you do when you go to work at your W-2. So that money is, is sheltered uh, with depreciation. So essentially, uh, the government knows that that house you're buying uh, is going to deteriorate over time, over 27 and a half years. You know, you're going to have to replace the carpet and you're going to have to paint and cabinets are going to fall apart. So you got to take a little piece of that and, and write it off essentially every year against the actual income cash flow you make on a property. And so on a, on a typical uh, house here in Colorado, it's, I feel like it's usually around like uh, equivalent to what you're making in cash flow to where they basically, it wipes out what you make. You, you actually make that cash, but you don't have to claim any taxes or close to it yeah. on your tax return. So the, 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 the law or the, the tax code says that you can depreciate a single family or a residential property over 27 and a half years. Okay. Uh, commercial, I think is 37 or 37 and a half. 40 maybe. It's somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. But residential is 27 and a half years. So just to make the math really simple, you cannot depreciate land. Okay. So let's say you buy a house for 325,000 and let's say the land is worth 50 grand of that. Okay. So you have what's called a cost basis of $275,000. You get to depreciate that over 27 and a half years, which is $10,000 per year. Okay. You get to take that as a loss. Okay. You also get to write off your mortgage interest. Okay. You also get to write off your mortgage insurance. If you have it, you wouldn't have it if you bought it as a rental property, but if you had, if you, you house act, you might have mortgage insurance. You get to write off your property insurance or your hazard insurance. Okay. You get to write off any expenses that you have with the property. Okay. Repairs you had to make. Yep. Okay. You get to write off your, um, let's say, oh, your taxes. You get to write off your taxes. Okay. And then you get to write off even just stuff like, because, because like we talked about in our last episode with Matt, I think it was episode six, this is a business, right? So you you now own a business. So anytime you drive to that rental property, you can write off the mileage for that rental, for that trip to the rental property. Okay. If you need to market it, you can write that off. Okay. You get, you get to write all these things off. And by the time it's, it's all said and done with the amount of interest that you're paying on your mortgage. Okay. With the amount of depreciation that you have, you will right now in Colorado, you will 100% write off every dollar that comes in and you will actually show a loss. Okay. Like if you find a property where you're not showing a loss, like buy it immediately because that means the cash flow on it, it the <laughs> ROI is insane on it, right? Okay, but you will right now, because of higher interest rates and things like that, you will 100% show a loss, which means even if you do have $300 a month of cash flow coming in, $3,600 a year, and even if we want to take this one step further and say you have 10 of those properties, on paper, you're going to show a loss for every single one of them. Okay, so you will now have made $36,000 in cash tax-free. Yep. Okay. Completely tax-free, right? The tax code, this seems so crazy, but the fact that you can depreciate an appreciating <laughs> asset, it's confusing. It's very confusing. Okay. But the government looks at it and goes, yes, your property, I love Matt's word for it, is going to deteriorate. And so we're going to give you credit for that. You can take that up front. Okay. And in this episode, we're not going to get into the, you know, if you, if you are educated on this, we're not going to get into like unrecaptured uh, depreciation and what happens when you sell it. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about those later. Okay. But you get to depreciate the property and you get to show a loss. Okay. So now we've got $36,000 a year of cash flow coming in completely tax-free. Okay. So, you build that even higher. You own tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate, like Donald Trump, for example. And now we've compounded that loss and we show even bigger losses. Okay. So how do we take it yet one step further? And this is again, this is going to show you how we can build really tremendous amounts of wealth. And you can be in a position like Donald Trump, for example, and pay 4% taxes. The next piece, the next step, as you grow and, and have more properties and maybe bigger properties, the next piece of the tax code that is really powerful is, is taking, is using what we call cost segregation and bonus depreciation. So Matt, can you explain what those are? Yeah. So cost segregation. Um, so in a mixed example, you know, you take the land out and then you divide the house over 27 and a half years and cost segregation, it divides it up 
into different buckets. So you have, uh, I think it's a five-year bucket. Is it 10 or 15? Uh, I think there's a five, uh, 12, or no, a five, uh, I think it was like a five, a seven and a 12 or something like that. Anyway, so the shorter four. buckets, basically, um, you know, you you might like have like flooring might go in the five year bucket. Uh, the roof is in the 15 year, the 30 year bucket. And so it's going to, uh, and you have to have a professional company that does this. An engineer will come out and look at the house and they will chop it up for you into the appropriate buckets of where these things will be. And essentially what that does is, you know, the structure, you know, a portion of the house isn't going to fall apart in the 27 and a half years, but some of it's going to fall apart a lot faster. Like carpet, that's not going to last 30 years. That might last five. So you got to take the cost of that carpet up in your in those first five years versus having to wait 27 and a half years and chop it up, you know, into 27 and a half year pieces for it. Right. So you have so basically instead of doing ten thousand dollars a year with a depreciation, years one through five might be like twenty-five grand a year. Mm -hmm. And then years five through ten might be like eighteen grand a year. And then 10 through 15 might be like 12 grand a year. And then 15 through 27 and a half might be like six or four. Yeah, a little bit less. Right. You're, so you're going to lose depreciation on the back end, you're but kind of just accelerating things. We're, forward. we're just accelerating it forward because ultimately what happens is when you take a loss in, in, uh, in real estate, you can carry that over infinitely. So you can carry that, that loss over forever. So if, if you're going to get a loss, if you're going to get to claim a loss 20 years from now, why not just take it now if you could? And it'll carry over up to 20 years from now anyway. So you're, you're taking it now. Okay, so this is pretty incredible. We can push and it, it's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Like if you got a $275,000 property, okay, depreciating $10,000 per year, that example I just gave is pretty pretty on point. You, you could really probably push $125,000 worth of that appreciation, 40, you know, you know, 30, 40, 45% of the value of the property up in those first five years yeah. and take that appreciation and take big losses. So you take $25,000 per year instead of 10, which is an additional $15,000 loss. Okay. That $15,000 loss times 10 properties or whatever. Now we have $150,000 loss. The reason that Donald Trump didn't pay any taxes for so long, and I don't remember what year this was. I think it was in the late nineties. He took a huge loss. Like I'm talking like a hundred million dollars of loss because Donald Trump has huge buildings. Yeah. Right. And, and here's the crazy thing about it. When we, when we think about this, you get to take a bigger loss than it even cost you to buy the property. Right. Because the we're leveraging, right. And you get to depreciate the whole asset. So just like, just like when we get to buy an asset and we get to, we get to, uh, enjoy the appreciation of the entire asset, even though we only put a small piece of money down, yeah. we get to enjoy all the depreciation of the entire asset too, even though we only put a small money amount of money down, right? So, so that's what we call cost segregation. Now, we can go even one step further and over the last, really since Trump's last tax code, which was in 2016, 2017, he passed... I think it's 2016. I think it's 2016. He passed tax code and he added um, bonus depreciation, which is good all the way. Well, we have another four years of it and it's slowly phasing out and it may come back depending on who puts the new tax law into place. But bonus depreciation goes one more level. Do you know what that does? Can you explain what that does? I think uh, is in the first year, you can take 100 percent bonus depreciation. Yeah. So anything that was pushed up to the first five years, in the first five year bucket. So in those five year buckets. So if we had 25, 25, 25, 25, 25 bonus depreciation allows you to take all of it in year one. Okay. So, and that was since 2016, all the way up until last year. And now this year you get 80%. 80%. Next year is 60%. The year after that's 40, then 20, then zero. Okay. It phases out, I think in 2026 or 2027. Okay. Now, again, somebody could come in and rewrite the tax code and change all that. Yeah. But that bonus depreciation allows you to take essentially 30 to 40% of the entire value of the property and write it off as a loss in your very first year of property ownership. Okay. And what's the typical down payment? 
I mean, a typical down payment's 20, 20 to 25%. And you're, so say that again, you put yeah. down 20%. Yeah. So if you, so if you bought a 375 or a $325,000 property, you'd put down six between 65 and 75 K and you'd take $125,000 loss in depreciation alone in the first year. So you got all your other expenses, you can write off property taxes, yeah. all that other stuff. Yeah. So this does now keep in mind, this doesn't change your cash flow number. This is on paper, right? It doesn't change your cash flow number. Your cash flow number is still gonna be 300 bucks a month, $3,600 a year. Okay, the difference is you don't have to pay any taxes on it. This is where now we're gonna take one more step and this is where it gets really, really powerful, okay? When you file your tax returns as a property owner, as an income property owner, you have two different ways that you file your taxes. You have your W-2 and your or your salary income or whatever, and that is your active income, okay? That gets taxed through income tax, okay? Then you have passive income. Passive income comes through passive businesses or something like owning real estate. It's passive income. I think it's on a Schedule C. Don't quote me on that. Ask your CPA, ask your tax preparer, but I think your real estate goes on a schedule C. All right. Anyway, (laughs) you list all of your real estate and that goes on a schedule C and any income that you have from that has a passive gain to it or or uh, yeah, passive gain. So in this case, you would have your $36,000 in cash flow, but then you would depreciate the property. And now you're going to be back in, like I said, you're more than likely going to be negative. Okay. If you didn't do cost segregation, if you didn't do bonus depreciation, you might be negative a couple of thousand bucks. No big deal. Okay. Now, if you qualify as a real estate professional, okay, your passive gains on income properties are no longer considered passive gains. They're considered active gains because it's your job. Okay. So it's active income now, not passive income now. So if you have now active income, you also take active losses. If you take an active loss of four or $5,000 because you didn't cost segregate and you didn't do bonus depreciation and you just do a normal cost segregation, okay? Or I'm sorry, you do a normal depreciation, you depreciate 5,000 bucks, okay? Or you take a $5,000 loss. You can take that $5,000 and you can push it against your active gains. So like for me, as a real estate professional, the money that I make buying and selling homes with people, I can now take that $5,000 loss and I can offset my active gains with that, okay? Now offsetting five grand isn't that big of a deal. But if I do cost segregation and I write off $125,000 in year one, and I do that times four properties, I'm going to take a $500,000 loss. Okay. Now I've got a $500,000 loss that carries forward. Now let's say as a real estate professional, or as a real estate broker, I make $100,000 a year. Okay. So I make $100,000 a year. And let's say that's after all of my expenses as a real estate professional. I make $100,000 a year. That's active income that I would be taxed on. If I made $100,000 a year, my income or my tax bracket would probably be somewhere in the 22% range. So I'd owe $22,000 in taxes, okay? $22,000 to $25,000 in taxes. But I've got this passive loss of $500,000. So now what do I do is I take this passive loss that really isn't a passive loss because I'm a real estate professional, okay? And now it's an active loss. So now it offsets the $100,000 worth of income and now my tax bill is zero. Okay. And I still have $400,000 more of loss that I can take over to next year. So if next year I make $100,000, I don't pay any taxes. Or check with your tax professional. But if your wife isn't in real estate, that's right. But you file together, that's right. You can offset your wife's. That's right. So. So that's where the that's where kind of this cheat code comes from. Where if you go, well, Nick, I I have my own job. I I can't become a real estate professional. Sure, can your spouse? Mm-hmm. So I hear stories like this all the time. People that really understand this. Husband's a husband's a surgeon. Okay, makes seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay? You know what the tax bill is on seven hundred thousand dollars a year? It's like a quarter million dollars a year. Okay, so the spouse becomes a real estate professional, okay? Gets their license, actively actively works in real estate. They start buying some rental properties. They start cost segregating it. They start taking losses. 
Okay, those losses move over to the spouse's gains. Now, all of a sudden, that two hundred and fifty thousand dollar tax bill that they had isn't there anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is where I, I I I would have to maybe put this into a spreadsheet, but this is where I'm going to start to challenge the fact that appreciation would be number one. Because let's put this into perspective a little bit. Let's say you have a spouse that makes a million dollars a year, great income, right? They would be on the hook for $350,000 in taxes, okay? So take that $350,000, you, you, you have all your property, okay, a bunch of property, and you cost segregate it, and you take, let's just make it easy, you take a million dollar loss. So you completely offset the tax bill. So now what do you do? You take that $350,000 next year, okay? You don't have any carryover. You used all of your depreciation, you used all of your cost segregation, you used all of your bonus depreciation. It's all gone. You don't have any carryover. Okay. So next year, if you make a million dollars, you're going to be, you're going to owe 350,000. Well, here's my argument. You take $350,000 in taxes that you saved and you go buy, well, whatever $350,000 worth of property will do leveraged, which is 1.4 million. You take that 1.4 million worth property that you buy the following year and you cost segregate it. And you take bonus depreciation and you take the $1.4 million property and push it all up, take your depreciation, 30, 40% of that, push it all up in the first year. And now you've got another $600,000 loss to offset income again. income again the following year. So every time you make a tax savings, you take that tax savings, you reinvest it into another piece of real estate. You cost segregate it, you bonus depreciate it as long as that lasts, and you offset your next year's income. This is how people like Donald Trump and Robert Kiyosaki don't pay taxes. That's exactly how they do it. You just keep buying real estate, okay? And then you get to the point where, so I just gave you an example where the first year you were able to write off all your income, but the second one we get to, you know, it was only, you know, Three fifths of it, right? You only had a six hundred thousand dollars appreciation. Well, now what you do is you just get to a point where your income, you're making enough income from your real estate that you don't, you're not working on that. You don't have to work on that on that other side, right? And then your real estate, as it appreciates, you borrow against that real estate. So instead of buying whatever $350,000 will buy you and you buy 1.4 million, you also re-leverage the old properties by doing cash out refinances, which is a non-taxable event, by the way. So take out another 200,000. So now you have 550,000 and go buy $2.2 million for the property. Now you can write off, you can cost segregate and pull and, and offset your entire million dollar expense. So this is where the cheat code kind of comes from. With real estate investors, this is how legacy wealth is built because the power here is that by owning real estate and by doing cost segregation, bonus depreciation, even if bonus depreciation didn't exist, you still have a five-year period where it would essentially do the same thing as it does right now. Yeah. Right? So once you got that ball rolling, you got to year five, you'd be solid, right? Yep. The idea is that you can you can keep buying property using the money that you saved by not paying taxes and doing it over and over again and i would argue that the appreciation that you might see on let's say a million dollars worth of property right let's say again 4% so you get $40,000 worth of appreciation but if you cost save that and use bonus depreciation and move $400,000 worth of depreciation up into the first year. And you take that 400,000 and offset it and save $100,000 in taxes. You got $40,000 in appreciation, which you can only borrow 75% of if you wanted to re-leverage it. Yeah. So you can borrow 27 grand, 28 grand of that 40. Or you can take the $100,000 you saved in taxes and reinvest it. And that's why I have a bit of a challenge believing that actually appreciation is the number one type of return. And if you if you if you have a way that you want to refute that or have can play devil's advocate, feel free. But as I process it and I realize that now again, if you didn't have the income 
to offset that. Like if you were making 50 grand a year and took huge losses, that doesn't matter. But if you, if you built your, if if you built a portfolio of real estate that was cash flowing you 200,000 a year and didn't pay taxes on it, I'm telling you that I believe that the value of the tax savings, being able to reinvest that tax savings is actually more powerful than the appreciation itself. I think, I think it can be in the right situation. Sure. I think, especially if you have a high income producer in the family. I think that's, I think that's the key. Cause if you're making your money in real estate and you know, you're doing one of the different ways you can, you know, refinance to pull cash out, you're getting it through cash flow, all these other things that are kind of already protected. Right. But yeah, I think 100% if you're a high income earner, that's not in real, you know, you can do yeah. a perfect mix. With so you're Donald Trump, stuff. you're Robert Kiyosaki. Mm-hmm. So when you're wondering how these guys don't pay any taxes, that's how. They're high income earners. They can keep just offsetting that income and then using that huge amount of taxes to go purchase more real estate. And just like, it's a, it's a massive snowball. Mm-hmm. And and yes, I agree with you. I think in certain situations, but for, for some people, for high earners, especially, and if you can make a spouse or something like that, a, a real estate professional, it's huge. it's huge. It's cheat code. It literally gives you the ability to not pay any taxes. And then you can use that money to reinvest. And there might be some people, like I said, we're going to ruffle some feathers or there might be some people that maybe get upset about the fact like, well, well maybe like people, everybody should be paying their fair share in taxes. Here is my one and only argument to this. And, and, and if you can honestly say that you would do differently, then call me and let's have a conversation or, or whatever. Let's come on my podcast and let's talk about it. Maybe I'll change your mind. But every single person in the United States, every single year when you go to file your taxes, your tax preparer will come to you and say, hey, you qualify for a standard deduction. You're married, it's 24,000 and change or something this year, or you're single, it's 12 grand. I challenge somebody to call me up, drop me a message, send me an email that says, I refuse that deduction every year because I feel like I should pay my fair share in taxes. There's not a soul in the United States of America that tells their CPA, you know what? I just rather pay my taxes on that. Like, right. I just rather pay my taxes on it. It doesn't happen. Okay. It's no different than when Donald Trump's CPA comes to and says, Hey, you qualified, you you know, we did bonus depreciation on your properties. You qualify for, you know, this deduction um, that'll save you X amount of dollars in taxes. And he goes, yeah, that's great. Sounds good. Right. So you can, you, you know, you can vilify that as much as you want, but the reality is it's written the tax code. It's legal. It's what it is. Everybody's taking advantage of the tax code in one way, shape or form. Right. And again, I don't think it's fair to judge, you know, what people, you know, oh, well, they're not paying their fair share in taxes. Yeah. But maybe they're taking that tax savings and they're philanthropists, right? You can be mad at Bill Gates for making a ton of money, but he's donated billions and billions of dollars to charity, right? And the ability to grow that was because he's, you know, you can't grow tremendous amounts of wealth being taxed at 40%. Yeah. You can't, you just can't do it. If your tax bill is 40% every year, you cannot grow crazy, tremendous amounts of wealth and build a legacy portfolio. You just can't do it. The tax incentives will allow you to do this, right? It's the same reason why like people complain, oh, Amazon doesn't pay any taxes. Yeah, but it's because they came in and they they created 10,000 jobs. And that's what I was going to say is, you know, the, the tax code is a series of incentives. That's and exactly the reason, the reason it's written that way is to get people to do what the government wants. And what they want is housing for people because housing creates so many things. It's, you know, there's people that are building the house. Then there's people, you know, that are servicing it. It creates so many jobs beyond what it is. Uh, you know, and that's, that's why they incentivize it. And you know what the funny thing is, and if somebody knows the exact number to this, drop something in the comments or something, but there's an interesting uh, thing. Out there, I think the tax code is something like 700 pages long. And it's something like, 10 of those pages, again, I'm making up a number here, but it's super low. A small percentage of the pages, like 10 of those pages tell you what you can't do. The rest of them tell you what you can do. Yeah. Right. Like, and so it's the the tax code is a series of incentives. Exactly. Like you said, that's what it is. It's 690 pages giving you incentive to do certain things with your money. Because now as, as a real estate investor, you know, this is out there. That's going to, 
And, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff too that we haven't got into opportunity zones and a bunch of other things you can sure. do. But you have that incentive to go buy real estate, to provide housing, to, you know, build ground up housing. Right. There's so many things that it, it's an incentive for that's good for the country. That's right. And that's why they yeah, developers get incentive, not only through the tax code, but they get incentive through local community, right? They say, hey, build this community for us. We won't make you pay any of, you know, or, or Amazon, hey, build this huge distribution center. We won't, you don't have to pay any personal property tax on it, or you don't have to pay, you know, whatever employee tax on it or whatever, because we know that you're going to create 10,000 jobs. We know that, you know, so there's the, the, the tax code is exactly that. It's a series of incentives and it's literally like, like 98% of the tax code is incentive. And then the other 2% is like what you can't do, what you're not supposed to do, what you're not allowed to do. Right. So this is where it, it, it's really, really powerful. And it, and it allows people to compound and build that crazy amount of wealth. And then where the last piece to this is, and this is, again, current tax code, this could change in the future. But there's one more piece of the current tax code that allows this to happen and then offsets anything that you might be thinking about right now. Well, you know, eventually you're going to have to sell those places and you're going to have to pay taxes on that appreciation or you're going to have to, uh, you know, recapture your depreciation and that kind of stuff. And that's all true. Okay. Except the fact that if we build a legacy portfolio, and when I say legacy portfolio, I mean something that is passed down to your, you know, your children or your heirs or whatever. Okay. We have something in the tax code called step up basis. That means when you die with your property, whoever inherits it gets to inherit it at the, what we call a cost basis at its current value. So if I buy a property for a million bucks and I hold it for 30 years, okay, and I die, okay, or let's say in, before I die in 30 years, it's worth $5 million, okay? If I were to sell that property, if I, let's say I'm on my deathbed and I go, you know what, let's sell that property. I want to give, I want to give the money to my kids. Okay. I'm going to make a $4 million capital gain minus any money I'm putting the property over those 30 years. Okay. But I'm going to have a $4 million capital gain. That capital gain is going to be taxed at long-term capital gains, which in Colorado, federally it's 15%, but then Colorado has two more sets of taxes that they hit you with. And you can be right around 25%, depending on your, depending on your income level. So I'm going to owe a million dollars in taxes. Okay. Or I can die with that property my heirs get to inherit that property at its current value at 5 million bucks. So they acquire it at $5 million. They sell it for $5 million. They still get the same amount of gain that they would have had I sold it and just given them the money, but now they pay zero in taxes. Okay. That's called step up basis. It's part of the tax code and it allows you to pass property onto your heirs without them having to pay taxes on it. So you could build this tremendous portfolio that you've depreciated like crazy, that's gained a ton of value, and then you die with it and leave $10 million in real estate, okay? This is really powerful stuff, right? And um, there's another piece of this where we go, you know, right now the tax code also states, and this is going to change here, but right now the tax code states, I think right now there's a limit on, um, on the kind of estate, which is, um, I think it's $11 million. So anything over $11 million gets taxed. Like if you leave an estate worth more than 11 million bucks, it, it gets taxed. But again, there's ways around that too. And I don't want to necessarily get into that right now. There's, but there are ways around that. And that's why you get these generational families of wealth, right? The, you know, the Turners and the Kennedys and Trumps and because, they just keep pushing that wealth down through the generations and they don't pay any taxes on it. They don't pay any taxes on it while they're growing it. And they don't, don't pay any taxes on it when they pass it on because they understand or they've hired people that understand the tax code. Yeah. It's really, really powerful stuff. And that's why I think to a certain extent at a higher level, I, I believe that this portion could be ranked number one, right? To a certain extent, this could be ranked number one for the right people. This could be the number one incentive. Yeah, I think it goes. I think it shifts when you're first starting out. Cash flow is the most important thing to you. Then, as you start to grow your portfolio, then appreciation you start to see. Oh, actually, that's more important. 
And then once you've built this big portfolio, then you start seeing the tax savings. Agreed. It kind of shifts over time. Agreed. I, I, I would agree with you. So I think these... Uh, that's a great point that this is a dynamic scale, right? Like it might be, you know, cash flow could be number one at some point. And actually you're right. Cause I think it'll go back to cash flow. When you get to that point where you want to retire, you want to quit, quit working your day job or whatever, yeah. cash flow is important. So that's when you sell all your stuff in Colorado and you go into Cleveland and you go, I don't really care that the properties are never really appreciate. I just want crazy cash flow so I can travel the rest of my life. Yeah. And then cash flow becomes number one again. So you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So there's, it's constantly changing. Yeah. Um, well, I, we covered a lot there. I think that, <laughs> I, like I said, many of this, a lot of this, I could go on for a long time about the some of the tax code incentives that we have and how people shelter their money and, and some of the crazy ways that people get out of paying taxes. And I... I all I know, like I said, I'm not here to, to, to pass judgment about whether you're paying your taxes or not. Um, it's more... What are you doing with that money uh, that maybe you're saving? You know, are you are you helping other people? Are you trying to try to better yourself and better the people around you? And and so, um, but but this is really powerful stuff, and this is all stuff that you that you don't get investing anywhere else. It, it, this is what you get in real estate. You don't get this. Uh, there's other tax incentives investing in business, and there's other, but it's this is by far one of the most powerful things. And if you really just added up all these compound effects and all these pieces to the puzzle, the ROI on real estate investing is so big. It's so big. And um, I, I think if you can stomach it, if you can have the, um, you know, if you can go through and, and go, you know what, being a landlord is worth it. Or, you know, having some extra stresses, small stresses in my life, is worth the financial gain, the long-term financial gain and the, the future, you know, for my future self to making some of those sacrifices for my future self. Um, it really is, is worth it. So, um, Matt, thanks for the discussion today. Um, uh, this one was fun. This is one of my favorite topics. So <laughs> I think, I think we'll, we'll talk more on some of this stuff in the, in the future, but, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining today. See you again in a couple of weeks and, um, you know, Go save some money, go buy some real estate, get out there, live big. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Live Big Podcast. For even more real estate and investment resources, go to blackyetigroup.com slash resources and download Nick's complete guide to running your own rental properties. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, live big. Live Big does not provide investment, legal, or tax advice, and nothing herein should be construed as being financial, legal, tax, or other advice. Live Big does not represent that any securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. No investment or other decision should be made solely based on the contents or information found on the website or podcast. When making a decision about your investments, you should seek the advice of a professional financial advisor or qualified expert.